in a world of podcasts. One rises in the night to destroy them all. The Elder God in an ocean of noise. The Cthulhu of the airwaves. This is Spoiler Country. All right, everybody, welcome again to another episode of Spoiler Country. Today on the show, we have a treat for you. He is a director, he's a writer, he's done a lot of things, wears a lot of hats. Hilton Ariel Ruiz. How you doing, Hilton? Hey, what's up, man? How's everything? Good, man. Thank you for having me on. No worries, man. Dude, we're, we're excited to talk to you. I've seen Zombie with a Shotgun, which I'm sure a lot of horror fans have already seen it. It is super fun, and it really intrigues me that it came out of, you know, a, a short series that you made that you then turned into this this crazy, insane acid trip of a, a zombie movie. You're just yes. throwing so many crazy things and making it work. Tell me, how did you get started in filmmaking to begin with? Let, let's go back. I want to hear I want to hear about Baby, Baby Hilton. Yeah, I, I would say it, it started off with you know i grew up in a large family you know i grew up with sort of like the brady bunch you know i had the three boys three girls mom and dad i had my aunt living with me so we had a huge household so you know one of the cheapest things to do is to take all the kids out was to go to the movies and we would do that the weekends we would go out to the movies and we will you know every weekend i mean it was literally nice. every weekend so that that actually was the start of the interest uh, of me getting into filmmaking and you know you know how it is when you're young you know you know before internet and everything you know you would come home and, and, and interact you know you know reenact the films that you saw on, on, on you know you just seen <laughs> and so you know when i was young i was like oh I, I wanted to be you know a filmmaker you know but at that time it was you know wasn't really ever thinking of really pursuing it but i did buy all, my own you know camera i actually would when i was like 13 14 my mom bought me a you know like a, a camcorder and i started just filming making like these little crazy short films so i would say that grew into me when i was lucky enough when i went to high school i, I took a, a film course in, in high school and boom i was i was like this is it this is really what i really want to do and then from there you know took it all all, all the way I, I never stopped from there kept on you know doing my own projects here and there and you know, going to film school here, you know, went, went to some, you know, couple of uh, film trade schools. I wanted to learn so much about the craft. I wanted to learn, you know, everything that, that I can possibly learn so I can take those, you know, those, those tools with me to create my own film. And, and I think that's, you know, that, that was the start. The start was starting from, you know, going to these movies and, you know, having these amazing memories that i had with my family you know it's it's amazing because you know I, I could watch film now and when i watch film you, you know especially mostly all the 80 movies i i can i always say oh, i saw that theater i saw that movie theater <laughs> you know and i could and it's so funny because you know the experience of going to the movie theater is so much bigger than just staying home watching a film on netflix and you know i know the new generation you know it's different now especially with covid now not a lot of people's going to the theater and it's just when I see a film that I saw in the theater and watch it at home, I said, Oh, I, I remember seeing that film when I was young. I can still remember what I was doing. I can still remember when I was with my, my, my family, we, you know, horsing around and I was the youngest one. So it was pretty cool. I was the youngest one and looking all, you know, out for all my older siblings. And, you know, I was more of the, you know, the kid, you know, playing around. So I, I remember those days and I think that was awesome. And I think that that definitely still grew with me. But yeah, that that I would say was the, the start of, of me getting to filmmaking. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. It's so different now with film and how it's presented. It's immediate gratification, like all the time, especially with like the, the streaming services. Whereas, you know, when, when you were a kid, you know, the anticipation of wanting to wanting to see a film that that was something else and, and yeah. I, I remember my, my uncle took my sister and i in his delorean so that that's going to date it took us in his delorean to uh go see willow in the theater oh yeah yeah and that was 
the coolest experience ever. And the the movie I, I rewatched it not long ago. It's not that great. Hold up. Yeah, you know what's so fun? <laughs> I remember I watched it also in the theater. Yeah, yeah. It was such a yeah. good movie. It was so fun uh, as, as a kid. As an adult rewatching it, maybe not so much, but <laughs> it was it was fun. It was super fun as a kid. Who who are your heroes in terms of filmmaking? You know, I like I, I like them. I like them all. You know, I could tell you that there's so many, you know, every director that you can name, you can pick a gem that they created. And, you know, uh, you know, I, I could always tell you one of my favorite directors, of course, which is many people's favorite directors. Uh, it's really Scott. Um, oh, yeah. So, you know, th those films, you know, you can watch them over and over and study them and, and see, you know, what he was doing uh, when he was making these films. And but, uh, you know, Cronenberg, John Carpenter, of course, you know, Tim Burton, all those filmmakers, you know, from Quentin Tarantino. And you can name all those directors. I, I, there's always a gem that they have. And you can take those films and it just it's an amazing, you know, the, you know, the work that they have. So I, I looked up to many of them, many of them and, and, and their accomplishments that, they, that they've created. Well, it, it makes sense because your your output the stuff that you've done is all over the place in terms of genre. You don't stick to one thing. And that's always refreshing to see somebody that, that sticks their neck out instead of, you know, staying in their one little hole and yeah. just kind of burrowing in. You've done, you've done documentary, you've, you've done horror, you, you've done a bunch of different stuff. And it's, it's a lot of really fun stuff too. You did one, documentary in particular air the true memoirs of gilsey alicia yes gilsey alicia yeah oh sorry sorry no no it's it's actually you could not you can actually pronounce it that way i pronounced it in you know in, in a latin way you know so alicia is, is how you would pronounce it but the way you pronounce it also is it's a way that you could pronounce it that that story is is heartbreaking and what, how was that as, as a filmmaker coming in and, and documenting? Yeah, I, and I, I would tell you that that's very interesting that you brought that, that, that film up. Because, all right, I'm going to just say this real quick and then I'm going to rewind of how that started. We actually, we actually going to re-release the film this year. The, we, we did that film, well, when I, when I did the film and it, and it was released, well, I'm going to take it back. We never released it because of the topic. It was, it was such a very hard topic. It's heavy. It's very heavy. So we had to pause the release of the film when I first shot the film. So during COVID last year, March, I don't, don't even ask me what came to my, my mind or whatever. I was just, the film came to, and I said, oh my God, you know, what happened? You know, what we, we, we need to release this film. And I said to myself, the best way I can release this film is I can contact something better, which is Gil, and ask him, hey, look, man, you know, it's almost 10 years. Yeah, yeah. Many, many, many people have been asking about this film. And, you know, you know, I, I, the film got exposed a bit a little bit with, you know, when I, I, there was a splash when, it, when I was announcing for it to come out. Like I was in, you know, over here in, in television, New York from Channel 7, 9, 5. You know, everybody was talking about the, about this film that was going to be released. And we put a pause to it. So I reached out to him and you wouldn't believe it. It, 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 was, it was amazing. Gil had the same feeling. He was like, I think you're right. So we decided to go back and interview him and do a conclusion of what had happened from when we shot him. And so when he started his journey, so let's go back about 10 years ago. I had this producer really interesting. I was invited to a Rihanna party to meet this producer. Right. And, and out of this, you know, it, it, the reason why I laughed because the gentleman that I was meeting for this, this producer's project was this very like, you know, he's an elder guy. You would never think that he would be in a Rihanna party. <laughs> so, I go there and, you know, I, I, I say, hey, what's, what's going on? He goes, listen, uh, I, I heard you're a filmmaker. And I, I looked at some of your work and I spoke to some of your colleagues and I think you're the perfect guy for this project. So he tells me right away, he says, you know, there was this young kid, 95, 96, released a book called The Air Down Here. And it was about this boy who, you know, lived in the South Bronx and his parents both had HIV. Mom passed away from HIV. His sister passed away from HIV but his father still lives. And he became this poster boy child of what was taboo 
at the time to even say that your parents had HIV. And he said he, he made a huge splash. He was in Channel 7 and, and Dateline and uh, 2020 and Diane Sawyer. He was in everything. He was in Life Magazine. He had a, a eight-page spread. This kid was huge. I, and I looked it up. During that time, he was still able to gather information online. And I couldn't believe how big did this you know, kid at the time became from this book. But the thing was that no one could find him. And this producer said, I found him. And, and I, I want you to go search more deep and find out why did he just go, you know, missing, you know, all after all these years, whatever happened to him. So I said, fine. You know, so I, I, I pursue it, went to the South Bronx, you know, we, we, it was a very tough place in New York city. And I find out the truth of what had happened to him and of his struggles of living with, you know, addiction, abuse, mental, physical, and we get to learn the true story of what happened to him when he, is a, when he was young and his parents who had HIV. And there's a huge story there that was revealed in the documentary that caused that pause of the film not to be released. And uh, I get it. I understood it. Uh, I understood that the pain the individual was going but as time went by i just felt like you know i'm going to reach out to this guy because I, I think it's really important for him to tell the story because many many people go through it of you know of you know uh, of just being young and, and, and losing the parents and going through physical mental abuse and and, yeah, and i caught him he he said yes he agreed he it, it was bothering him that it didn't it wasn't released so we shot the conclusion of the film we put it together my editor and I, we actually went back and re-edited some of the segments and stuff, and it is completed. We oh, are wow. right now. We are right now trying to go into festivals and see where the film takes us. But I appreciate you, you know, checking that, you know, that one of those projects that I did, and, and see that, you know, how powerful and strong that that documentary actually is. And what? Really. It's fascinating to me because not not only did you have to do your directorial, you know, work, but you you had to be a detective. You, you had to track this guy down. You had to do the homework. You had to put in a ton of work that I don't know that a lot of people have the capacity to do. And especially on such a subject that is so heavy, so very heavy. Is he in a better place now? Yes, he is. I, I would say yeah. I would say when we were trying to, re at the time we was going to release it, he wasn't. He, still, he, he definitely wasn't. I have to say he is now. You definitely, like when the film comes out, you'll definitely see him at the end, how he looks. And it's it, the film is amazing because the film starts off of 1996 of him being on television with Diane Sawyer 2020. Oh, wow. And how we go find him in 1990, I'm sorry, 2011. And then we come back in 2020. So it, it's a big, you know, there goes almost what 25 years basically from 96 2011 and then the 2020 we can see the, how he grown you know what's gone you know the things that he, what he went through but yeah i i think i de i definitely feel like he is in a better place and it's, it was very strong the project and, and yes and, and i think that the, the you know when, when i was approached by the producer he felt that he needed somebody you know, he, he felt like somebody who could go into the South Bronx and, and, and not be fearful and going in there and, you know, in, in, you know, into the South Bronx and, and do this investigation, do this story without not being, you know, I guess being feared to go out there. And I guess he just felt like me also being in descent, but just like the, the, the just as Gil himself, which we both come from the same sort of background. I think he felt that was also a key. So, yeah, I, I, I can't wait for, for it to get released finally. And I think things are meant for a reason. You know, I think the, it was meant for a reason for this project to take that while to basically see, you know, what what how powerful this, this story is that is still kept with all of us and for it to be released and for everybody to understand that, you know, these things do go on and, in, 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 you know, in life and it's, and it's really hard. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't imagine the, the amount of like hurt that guy has been through. And I, I'm glad that you were able to, to find him in, in a better spot. Um, later on you in addition to to that you, you also kind of have a little bit of a horror bent and, and i say a little bit with you know kind of like a smile on my face because you you do some a lot of horror stuff starting off with i mean you you did zombie with a shotgun as a short 
which then turned into a ser- like a TV series, yeah. which then spiraled into a movie. Tell me about that journey and how did, what, what was the, the evolution of that? Yeah, no, I, 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 I yeah, it's, it's a pretty big journey. And, and you know, I, I like, I tell people that, you know, you know, as us independent artists, you know how it is to be an artist. It, it's, it's difficult to go out there and to do projects and stay with the projects and, and, and believe in the projects and make everybody around you believe in the projects. Uh, and and I think that's very important. You know, not giving up. And and this is this is this is one example of not giving up on zombie with a shotgun. And and I, and I'll tell you, you know, and, and you know, as you as you said before, I've done like certain. I did documentaries. You know, I did you know drama projects. I've done comedy. And and then it was this time that I was like, let me go into horror. And when I went to when when I went on zombie with a shotgun, and I'll be honest with you, I never expected zombie with a shotgun to take off the way it has where we decided to do uh five episodes and when we did the first episode that was the key and i would even go i would even go i would even take it to the point that that first episode was the engine that created everything that we've done since that first episode was so powerful but just that one episode we didn't even finish the series we went we did the first episode put it out and it went viral so as a you know we're going back wow we're going back almost eight years when i started that first episode oh wow. so we're, yes so time flies i can't even tell you so that first episode went viral and i honestly truth you know eight years ago you know, i was like oh wow i never experienced viral i i, I don't know how even to handle it you know, like, oh, shit. I was like, oh, shit, what, what do I do now? So when I, when I released that first episode, everybody was emailing me, or hitting me up on social media, thinking that this was like a trailer for a feature length film. And dude, I was getting networks hitting me up. Oh, wow. Me. So they were like, do you have this? Is a, we we want to see it. We want first tip. Can we, you know, can we go check it out? And I, web series that I'm doing and. And, you know, I wish, you know, are you guys interested? Yeah, let's talk. You know, so, but they, they were, everybody was interested, but no one really pulled the trigger. So I just continued to do the web series. So <laughs> I did, the, I did the first one and then you wouldn't even believe it. My actor, the lead actor got signed off the first episode and he's <laughs> off, he's off to California. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a minute, what about me? You know? <laughs> So he got signed for management, acting managing, and he was getting managed out there in California. And but the great thing about Braden, you know, he's an awesome guy. He did not abandon it. He was like, "Listen, you know, I'm coming back. We're going to finish this series." So he would come back and forth, and it didn't take us like, you know, like we didn't finish the series like in a year. It took us like maybe I think a year and a half too because of him going back and forth and and and. And, you know, it is what it is. We were still getting so much traction of it. It was unbelievable. I've done, you know, so many articles on it. So finally we finished the, you know, we finally finished the zombie with a shotgun web series. And there it is. My social media numbers are still growing by the day. There was times I was getting 4,000 followers a week. Oh, that's uh, nice. Some, yes. It was, it was, it was ridiculous. Sometimes uh, top it off. I was sometimes getting 8,000. And I, I didn't believe it. I was like, all right, this is great. This is awesome. What do I do now? You know, I'm still doing my little projects here and there. And I'm just thinking, you know, maybe we should get into doing a comic book. And then that's when I met Simone uh, Gugliolini, who's an, it's a famous Italian comic book artist. Yeah, she's you know, amazing. He, he, he decided to come on board and help me out and say, hey, look, we could expand this even more. Let's do artwork, comic books. So we did it. And I did other stuff, other art projects and other, you know, other, you know, working on other little documentaries, as you've seen. And every time I would do an interview, everybody would say, hey, what happened to Zombie with a Shaka? And I'm like, oh, man, everybody is in love with Zombie with a Shaka. <laughs> I, I, I felt as a filmmaker, uh, I, and as a person that finally got viral that not a lot of people could get, you know? And I was like, I don't think I could ever catch that wave ever again. You know, that, that, that's pretty hard to catch that wave. So I, you know... I was still, I, you wouldn't believe it. I was still getting so many followers. 
And I said to myself, you know what? Maybe it's time to go and, and, and don't get me wrong. I was still asking people, hey, you want to be part of this project? You know, come in and invest. But, you know, it's always the first, you know, everybody wants to see who's been the first penguin to jump into the water. Obviously, I didn't have money. Uh, I was trying to find, you know, funds and, you know, everybody was interested. Everybody was interested to come on board. But, you know, nobody wanted to, you know, you know, put in the whole money in the pot, whatever it is, you know. So I decided to do a campaign, which I did not want to do. But I thought it was a, a, one of the most amazing experiences as an artist, a filmmaker, to go out there and raise money for your own film. I, I met a... Gratifying. Uh, because people, yes. you see the people's enthusiasm behind what you're putting out. Yes, yes. So I met a Kyle Hester. He's also producer. He's also one of the people in the film. And we... What we spoke and we went together to raise money for the film and it took us almost I, I don't know how many years because even when we shot the first initial money we shot like 80% of the film and we ran out of money we had to go back on a campaign I never gave up on it and and, the, and again you know the actors didn't give up on it uh, everybody came on and it was a very difficult project to finish because we, we, we just didn't have enough funds all the time and you know but at the event at the very end we did complete the project, you know, and as you can see, there's a little, you know, there's a lot of things I put in there as well. I put animation, Robert Steele from MTV, who did, you know, Liquid TV, Stick Theater. He came on board. I got, you know, amazing makeup artist to do the, the finale of Zombie with a Shotgun. And it was, it, it's an amazing, it, it, it was an, an amazing journey to, to, you know, and to me, I felt like it was, you know, the, the, the essence of what independent horror filmmaking is. Oh, yeah, yeah. And... and those Go fans ahead. are rabid, too. So, so, and the the thing that I like about Zombie with a Shotgun is the name immediately tells you what you're in for, and it is is named as such that when you hear it, you're just like, "Oh fuck yeah, I'm in!" Like, I mean, yeah. Like, yeah. The other day, I saw a sign for Loaded Tater Tots, and I was like, "Oh fuck yeah, Loaded Tater Tots, yes." <laughs> I'm into it. So, uh, same thing with Zombie and a Shotgun. Yeah, we. Yeah, and we go back with Zombie and a Shotgun. You know, we finished the film to be finished. You know, there, there was that thing about me that I wanted to give the audience more about the Zombie with the Shotgun. And, and you know, I, I tell the fans we ran out of money. And, <laughs> and, and you know, that was what we definitely want to do for part two. We want to start off where we left off exactly. Where oh, he nice. became the zombie, and we take it from there, and that's the talks of us going into the to the sequel. You know, unfortunately, you know when COVID happened, we released the film on November twenty eighth. Was released in streaming services from you know of course Amazon, and we released it there. And three months later, COVID hit, everything shut down, and you know we felt we we felt like we fell short of really promoting the film. And, and don't get me wrong, we, we you know, we, we, we promoted the, you know, we were promoting the film a lot and, and we were getting so much traction when the film was released. It's just that COVID just kind of like, you know, definitely put a dent in it because everyone disappeared. You know how it was. Everybody, oh, yeah, yeah. Everybody disappeared. Uh, nobody was there to talk to. So, you know, that, that was, you know, th a little bit of, of the disappointment of, you know, of what happened when everything shut down i mean that's the cons too all the cons the cons had to shut down so and that yes, seems like, like yeah festivals and cons it seems like a great platform to to show off your movie especially because horror fans are all about the experience you are you just nailed it when when we were you know released the film we were excited we were like we're gonna do a convention tour uh, let's you know let's order the dvds let's order we we ordered all the merchandise i oh. I, I i still have the merchandise in my home I, and it's like it's so sad i was like you know the merchandise is still waiting there to go on to conventions and when that went down and we heard that, oh, okay, it's, you know, it's going to take a couple months. We're going to get over this. And then, boom, you know, everything was closed. Theaters, conventions, festivals, concerts. We were like, oh, man. So it took us to, you know, everybody. You know, everybody took a back step to this. All filmmakers, artists, you know, singers, everybody. Everybody, workers. You know, everybody took a back step on, on everything they were doing. And, you know, I just felt like, you know, 
we're everybody in the same boat and just we'll take it from there and when things get better we'll we'll you know get back on that design with a shotgun engine i hear you yeah in the meantime you, you you haven't i mean covid shut things down for theaters and everybody else but as far as you you've been busy since then you've done a documentary and, and you have a new project beyond the halls of paradise uh, yes can you tell us a little bit about that because that looks cool as shit. okay that's a uh, pretty good yeah so when covid happened everybody was sort of like what do we do as independent artists we're we trying to figure out so i had 666 was a also a Going. I actually that web series before Zombie with a Shotgun, believe it or not. So I started that web series and, you know, basically it is a story about, you know, Satan himself, the devil himself, whatever you want to call it, the entity who, who was born in 6666. And the, I started a web series and each web series to me, what I wanted to do is each web series was different. It was a different story, but about the same, you know, entity where everybody's talking about trying to figure out what it's all about by investigating it or bump into it or just some urban legend that's mentioned. So when I did the 666 uh, web series, Eli Roth's people called, they contacted me because one of the oh, episodes cool. uh, that I released, they loved. And they asked me if I wanted to do original content for their upcoming horror crypt, horror TV expansion. You, uh, obviously, everybody knows Horror Crip um, TV. So I, I agreed. I jumped on it right away. Anybody would. And before Crip TV was really put out there, uh, they had Horror. Uh, I'm not sure if you remember Horror. And I actually was the first person to open up that, under that umbrella. And so I went, we, we did an episode for them. And I did also extra episodes, but it never had the time to release because they closed the horror, the Crip Horror, and they went with Crip TV, which is, was sort of different what they were doing with Crip Horror. So there I was with these episodes, and I'm like, oh my God, I got these episodes that no one's really have seen. So, hey, you know, I was like, okay, you know, <clears throat> I'll, I'll, you know, shelf this for the moment and see what happens down the line. So when COVID came, <clears throat> you know, you, you, you have to, everybody was trying to figure out what to do as an artist. And, you know, everybody's trying to figure out how to, make, you know, every, like everybody else, how to make money, how to do these things. And I came up with the thing. I was like, hey, you know what? I still have a uh, pretty good circle of friends that would go out and shoot regardless of the pandemic. And I said, wow, you know, 666 can actually be an anthology featured film if I go out and shoot like four more episodes and put, put them together with the other episodes and make eight episodes of the same story. You know, of course it's about six, 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 you know, uh, beyond the halls of paradise. And I just felt that that would be the best thing for me to do as an artist while I was, while we were all dealing with COVID and it worked out. I was able to do four more episodes or four and a half new more episodes because we had to do some more extra stuff on the other, on the other projects, the other episodes that I shot that no one's seen. And we finished. We are probably, I'd say we are completely on the edit. It's just never be the next new project oh cool 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 so that's exciting man i can't wait to see it when it comes out i i'm curious when, when you're done with that are, are you planning on on going back to the uh, zombie with a shotgun too or is that like written yet or how far along I, the process are yeah, you? We, well we're we okay so when when here's another here's another thing that i never mentioned was that when when the zombie with a shotgun came out, there was a script that I already had completed for the sequel. Oh, cool. And we had, I had major interest from many people. And we were, believe it or not, I had these investors and producers that I was talking on maybe three times a week. Oh, wow. Uh, 
on creating the sequel. And when COVID hit again, it was disappointing. It was it just the, the, the conversation just, that's it gone, you know? So that would also, you know, that, that's something I didn't, I forgot to mention that we were like rolling into the sequel, like with, with so much interest because of the first one coming out. But, you know, and, and again, you know, I, 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 with COVID, it makes, makes everyone think, you know, a lot of things change, even, even for myself as in like, should I still continue doing the sequel? But there I, I use the resources like that I already had I'm like, okay, you know, to do Zanu part two, it's going to take a lot more than what we did for the first one. And, and, and there's just so much more involved. And that's why I went with, uh, you know, going with the 666, because I knew that my team, a bunch of actors, it was hard because, you know, there, there are actors that are co- would come back to the sequel that were in part one. And they were very, they, they were like nowhere, no way to even find, even if we would do a sequel, everybody yeah. decided to go their own way. So that that was another thing. That was difficult to even get actors. You know, even the main actor was just. There's no way we could shoot it. Yeah. So yeah. as things clear up, and you know, I'm very uh, optimistic. I think we all feel that you know the COVID is coming to an end, and we definitely want to um, explore that. And we, we, I had a conversation with with Kyle, you know, one of the producing the actors in the film, and we talked about possibly coming back around in September, and oh, wow. just to get probably the fans and everybody start the interest that, Hey guys, you know, and, we, and this is just an estimate thinking that by September when everyone, we feel like everyone's going to be going back to school and things will be a little bit normal. We think that's when we're going to start teasing everybody and say, Hey, look guys, you know, are you guys, we're ready to go to part two. Are you let's go and let's get everybody to see whoever's interested to come on board. Or, you know, if we have to do another campaign, we'll do another campaign. That's awesome. And, and I think that you, you would definitely have no problem getting people excited for, for that, especially with just the idea alone is so fun. So it, it just sounds like a good time. It, are there any other like genres that you would like to explore? Because you, you've done a lot of different things with your, with your filmmaking. Is there anything else that you'd want to kind of dip your toe into? You know, I definitely would love to get a little bit. I like to do like a, 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 a more of a, a hardcore science fiction film. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's something that I, 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 I'm actually working on that. I am working on a new graphic novel called Amplitude Modulation, you know, AM. And it is a sort of hardcore science fiction. And, and it's funny because it, it's not like I said, you know what, I got to do science fiction. It just, it was an idea that I had for many years. And I finally hooked up with the right, you know, artists to come on board. And, and this was something that I was working for a couple of years. And again, COVID was one that, you know, the artist was just like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm not doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I was like, all right, you know. You know, you, you know, I, I, I had mentioned the story and they loved the story and they were just like, you know, very busy. But they were like, hey, look, I really love that idea that you came up with. And so we already started. Even if you on my social media, I, I put up in my Instagram and even on my Twitter, I've given already some sneak peeks of some panels that is already being worked on. Oh, awesome. So, awesome. That with, the, with the comic book, you know, who knows, maybe, you know, it come out something, maybe a film. But definitely the next thing that I like to do as a film wise would be like a science fiction project. Awesome. Are, are y'all going to produce that comic via like Kickstarter or is it going through a, a publisher? Um, <clears throat> so right now the comic book is actually financed. Oh, cool. So yes. So it's really cool. So what, what we're going to do is at the very end when we're, we're completely done, we're probably going to go on a campaign to see people who want are interested in buying the comic book. And possibly, because right now we're, we're, it's going to be a black and white. Obviously, you know, with color, it's going to be much more more money. So with the campaign, we are suggesting that if uh, how much money we raise, we would, you know, get the comic book, you know, colorist on board to color comic book. But, you know, as it looks right now, I, I don't even think we, we even to do that. I mean, it looks amazing, black and white. And, you know, right now, right now, definitely when we're done, I definitely would love to look for a publisher to see who come on board and loves to distribute the comic book. That would be definitely ideal and to get it out there and definitely get more interest out there in the public to possibly even get it into a uh, second graphic novel or possibly, you know, get it into a 
feature length project. That would be awesome. You know, that's probably ideal with a lot of people who do graphic novels. That's something that they always want to get the film to get picked up or, you know, licensed to get into a feature yeah. film. Yeah. I mean, you already have the proof of concept. Just, you know, you, you show them the, the graphic novel, like, this is what I want. Let's, let's, let's talk turkey. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So, man, it, it looks like you, COVID hasn't really slowed you down too much. Staying busy. I, I love how you're able to, if one thing isn't going at the time, just because the world stops, you pivot and you find your footing and you you do something else. That's inspiring just as a as, as a writer. I, I did my first Kickstarter not long ago and we actually sent the everything off to print today. So, but as as a writer, you know, seeing people that can, you know, just move and meet the challenges that come towards them. That's, that's inspiring as hell. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to see what you do next, man. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. You know, I, I've, I've, you know, I've learned, you know, in the industry, you know, it, it, many times no one's going to come and, and, and most of the times <laughs> no one's going to come and help you or, or say, Hey, you know, it, it's a lot of times it's yourself, you know, you got to, self-promote yourself you got to promote you know you, you have to go out there and push this, you know what you have to do and i think a lot of people have the notion that you know uh i'm just going to come out here i'm going to do a project i'm going to release it and then somebody's going to find their ways in this project and then help me come out you know yeah that can happen you know very very rare slim whatever and i just learned that you know what i just i'm i'm an artist i'm going to put out what i like and you know not what i like and if they you know if people see it they see it they don't they don't they, you know you, you can't make everybody happy you know not everyone's going to like the stuff that you do and everything like that but i just know that at the end of the day you know just like with your project it's, it's your art and no one can tell you what you know anything different than that that's awesome yeah so what, one thing i like to ask people bef before we let them go is we need to keep comic shops open. Obviously, you're a comic fan. Do you have any comic shops that, that you want to give a shout out to? Wow. Sorry for springing that <laughs> on you, man. <laughs> you, brought that here. you know why? Because there's no really comic book shops that are like open. You know, you know, New York City, you know, has very, you know, they do have the comic book. You know, Midtown Comics, I would have to say to this day is probably one of my favorites and best. I'd love to go there. Um, I've never been to New York. So, I, I, yeah. Furthest I've Definitely. the furthest I've been north is Pennsylvania, and oh, so <laughs> it's still different. <laughs> but yeah, it's not, not that even the good part of Pennsylvania. I went to the like the redneck <laughs> Pennsylvania, which is essentially Alabama. You have like Philly and Pittsburgh, and then everything else is pretty much Alabama. And I know Alabama. I'm in Alabama, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely take a trip out there, out here. You know, it's uh, I guess when things start to I guess I, you know cool down or whatever things start to open up because right now you're still limited to going to the restaurants and stuff like that oh yeah, but, uh, yeah. You know, i'd love to give a shout out to midtown comics i mean you know they they you know again i i, I don't know what they everyone's hurting business wise and stuff like that and if you do come to new york that is a shop that you should go to you know a lot a lot of the stores i haven't even you know visited because of covid so that's one definitely comic shop to visit i hear you is there anything in particular just like any media inspiring you right now? Comic, movie, TV show? You know, uh, what I like, I, I started watching Dark. Uh, it's a oh, German... that's uh, fantastic. Yeah. Yes. That is pretty amazing. I, I think that would be, you know, if anybody's listening, they should check that out. And it's so amazing that because the, the voiceover, the English voiceover is so... If there are times that you like, are they speaking English or German? They, they did such an amazing job on the English voiceover that sometimes you can't even tell. And yeah, you know, that that's how amazing it is. It, you know, and I think that's in a great science fiction series slash horror, whatever you want to call it. But I think that's amazing. Yeah, they did that so well, and uh, it's so complex. It, it just feels like your brain is running out of your nose yeah. at the end of the episode. It's just so <laughs> like what? <laughs> Felt like yeah. I needed to take notes, but it's so good. It is really good. Well, um, yeah, it, that's definitely one thing out if any. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they, they really took it to the next level on the storytelling and stuff. And, man, I can't wait to see what else you come you come up with next because I've really been impressed with what I've seen. Hilton, it's been a pleasure, man. Likewise. Thank you so much for having me on. And I apologize for me driving. So. <laughs> dude, dude, I, 
if if you're cool with it, I'm cool with it. Sound audio is good, and it, it, it was it was good getting to know you, man. Likewise, man. Thank you so much. Right. Take it easy, brother. Uh, be just- safe and watch out for people with no masks. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Take care. Right. See you, brother. Bye. And we're back. That's right. We are back. Back in the saddle again. Well, (laughs) I hope you guys really, really enjoyed that as much as we did making it for you. And if you like what you heard and you want to hear more, you got to go check out spoilerverse.com because at spoilerverse.com, we have a plethora of amazing directors and artists of all walks of life and editors and writers and oh my god are you a lover of comic books like we are then so there's many. so many amazing people from the comic book world over at spoilerverse.com and i highly implore you to go there and check it out yeah and while you're there you can check out all the other podcasts on our network like Bridges and the geekdoms and funny book forensics and haphazard adventures and nerds from the crypt and so many more misery Point episodes Radio. all the time go check all of them out and Check out all of the reviews and previews and articles we have going up every single day for you. Every day on Spoilerverse.com for you to check out and to read and to love and to like and to comment. We have a store link. If you want to help support the site, you can do it two ways. One, go to our Patreon, which is this patreon.com slash or go to our store link in the middle of the site there and get a t-shirt, a face mask, a hoodie, something. Look fly as hell and help support the site when you do that because we get a dollar or two. And, you know, maybe you want to talk to us. If you do, you can do it you know, obviously on all the socials, but... If you go to scpod.us slash discord, you can join our public discord server and come chat with us all day long. I couldn't say it better myself, dude. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You just mouthed out a ton of information at once. And really, <laughs> I hope you guys enjoy what you're hearing because we're, we're working our butts off to bring it to you. We are. We are. I guess there's only one left thing. One left thing? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go with it. There's only one left thing left to do. What's that? In oceans of podcasts, we are Cthulhu. As Cthulhu compels you to Spaghetti. open the mind and read more. Spaghetti.